Okay, so welcome to the Mike Stillman Memorial Lecture. Um, this evening's lecture is in memoriam to Mike Stillman at the request of his widow, Kathy. Um, and I want to make a few comments about Mike, who's someone that I never actually met myself, but I've spoken to Kathy at some length, and she's given me a few notes about Mike and why she particularly asked for this lecture in particular to, uh, to, 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 to commemorate him and his life. So Mike was born in 1961 at Reading, which is a town famous for its clay pits and brick kilns, and which produced the building materials for many structures, including the Royal Shakespeare Theatre at Stratford-upon-Avon. So Mike studied history at Cambridge University, and he developed a huge lifelong enthusiasm for military history and historic buildings. And he was especially fond of the Vine in Hampshire, which is a tremendous Tudor era brick building. Uh, and he lived very close to that. Uh, and as a result, we've, we've made a consideration within the lecture. And right towards the end, we're going to actually discuss the Vine in a little bit of detail as well. So this evening's lecture is the Mike Stillman Memorial Lecture. And thank you very much to Cathy Stillman Lowe for um, asking me to put this talk on. And I hope that you'll all come with me on this journey to look at medieval brick buildings, which I think would have appealed to Mike, because we're going to be looking at the very elite end of um, medieval buildings. We're going to be looking at something which is essentially a bunch of castles and great houses. So this would fit in with Mike's interest in military history and, of course, historic buildings. Um, so we're going to talk until probably six o'clock or slightly afterwards. I'm going to make no promises whatsoever. And of course, the talk will eventually be uploaded to uh, YouTube, but it is being delivered live now. So if there are any problems, of course, uh, you know that I'll hopefully be back if my Internet drops out. OK, so the way that this talk is going to be structured then is I'm going to talk to you about the brick itself. What does this thing look like? Why is it important? Why is it noteworthy in the medieval period? Surely it's very common in the modern period. I'll talk a little bit very quickly about some of the early brick structures in the medieval period in the 11th and 12th centuries before getting into the meat of the subject, looking at where the ideas for the use of brick come from. And there's lots and lots of idea transfer coming around the North Sea diaspora, particularly from the Baltic and the Lower Rhinelands. And then I want to give a couple of case studies about when brick starts to become a really popular fabric among medieval elites, using Caister and Tattershall as those two case studies. And then moving on to look what happens from the middle years of the 15th century, when the royal family pick up on this, in particular, Henry VI and his queen, Margaret uh, of France, and how this develops into a Lancastrian court style, which is very, very recognisable. Finally, I want to look at what happens in the latter end of the 15th century, as the idea is picked up by so many more aristocrats, magnates, churchmen, and what happens as it motors on into the 16th century, and we see the influence of the Renaissance. So some of this material may have appeared in some of my other lectures, which some of you may have seen. However, it has been formulated into a, a discrete talk on medieval brick buildings, which I hope you'll enjoy as we explore power and prestige in late medieval England. Uh, why I might be considered to be the sort of person to talk on this subject is that I'm a buildings archaeologist of 20 plus years experience. My PhD, which I've recently just passed, uh, is on Tattershall and Tattershall's place in English building. Of course, it's one of the, the finest and earliest of brick buildings. And I run a company called Triscally Heritage. We're an archaeological consultancy who offer buildings archaeology services from patrons such as the, the National National Trust, all the way down to private landowners who get us in to come and survey and record our, um, their historic buildings. And as an offshoot of this, I do a lot of 
I suppose, broadcasting, both on television and radio and podcasting, but also in the form of lectures and courses. And I'm involved in lots of publications as well. So I have a, a particular speciality in castles and within that subject, brick castles as well. So that's my credentials to begin with. However, we're more used to seeing brick buildings in our everyday existence. This is a picture of the suburb of Nottingham where I live. It's called Snenton. This is actually taken from uh, some old brick pits up on the hill there. And as you can see, every building in view is, uh, it is constructed primarily of brick, the chimneys, the elevations, even the modern later extensions. Most of what you can see here in Snenton dates to the very late 19th century, but really the vast majority of the buildings that you can see, especially on the left hand side of the slide, date to uh, the early years of the 20th century, in particular the first two decades. So this is something which is very ubiquitous. Uh, we see lots and lots of houses constructed in it, and perhaps most of us don't think about the importance of brick. Um, it's so common. But when we cast ourselves back into the medieval period, we can start to understand that brick is actually a deceptively rare building fabric. So that when we start to hear about brick buildings in this country and the brick makers themselves, it becomes apparent that this is not an indigenous building tradition. We don't have lots of buildings being constructed in this fabric. For the vast majority of people in certainly lowland England, we're looking at timber framed architecture um, that is built to a, a reasonably high standard, but we're not looking at people living in brick houses at all. And part of the reason for this is that there just isn't the skill. There isn't the, the, the dedicated knowledge on how to actually make a brick, how to take a lump of clay and turn it into something which is a fired ceramic to all intents and purposes. So that when we start to see what could be described as an explosion in brick technology in the mid 15th century, it's very apparent that a lot of this building material is being put together by continental specialists. And time and time again, we see people who've been brought over to England, particularly the eastern counties of England, where there's a paucity of stone, natural building stone. They're brought over from the continent where there's an established long lived tradition in building in brick. So we get people like Baldwin Brickmaker in the Tattershall building accounts, and it's made clear elsewhere in the accounts that his surname is actually Dutchman. So he's been brought over from the German diaspora, whether that be the German states or the, the low countries is, isn't entirely clear. But other brick makers, uh, we also see their names um, quite often related to where they come from. So um, that the surname Fleming is very, very common as well, again, coming from the low countries. So the brick makers are being brought over. There isn't this local tradition of brick making that's widespread in England in the medieval period. Um, I quite like this image from Guerdelon, which is the, the castle that's being built in France using uh, original techniques, because it does show a female brick maker. And we know from building accounts of the period that roughly a tenth of the people who were involved in the building industry in the medieval period were women. And we even know of a female brickmaker, again at Tattershall, a little bit later, but it's actually Baldwin Brickmaker's wife who carries on the business after his death in the mid to late 1450s. And it's very apparent that she's always been involved in the business because she's able to take it on without there being a break in supply at all. And I suppose we can get an idea from the building accounts here of 1445, 46, that huge numbers of bricks are required to construct um, uh, a castle such as Tattershall. Here's a, um, an account for nearly three quarters of a million bricks. And we're going to see some figures which relate to that in just a moment. But the point here is it is um, it is manual dirty work. You can see here the clay is being pushed into a former, a mould, 
Um, they, they're having to do this very, very quickly. They're producing huge numbers of bricks. And these are actually then being stacked up and popped into air drying sheds. And here's a lovely later example of one of these things. I don't think we have a medieval example of a brick drying shed which survives. Um, but this is a place for the the moisture to evaporate from the bricks they've obviously got a roof on it but it's open sided on all four sides and it's just a framework and there's a nice example here which was originally in petersfield um, an 18th century building but it is to all intents and purposes this is what it would have looked like in a medieval brick drying shed these do appear in the manuscript illustrations as well so we, we would see them air drying the bricks and then they are being put into a clamp now the brick itself creates the, the clamp the clamp is a kiln um, it's not necessarily covered over we can see a modern iteration from rural india here on the on the left hand side and you can actually see that the air dried brick are being stacked up and then there are holes left in amongst them for the fuel the timber fuel the charcoal to then begin to to to, to bake the um the bricks to fire them so that we get a nice hard solid piece of material which can then be incorporated into the um, the structure now some of these are not going to fire particularly well we get examples which um, which actually explode in the kiln particularly if there are pebbles some of them will over fire and we get burnt ends or they'll blacken and they can be used to pick out um, decorative um, designs called diaper work which we'll touch on in a moment but assuming that the firing of the clamp works we end up with thousands and thousands of bricks and we must consider the brick itself now this is a replica medieval brick um, from Tattershall um, we can see it here on, on my screen there is the brick uh, and I've, you can see that I've put the the dimensions on it the dimensions are quite important these are handmade bricks you can see that they've got drying cracks on them they're not uniform they're not machine made they're not rubbed down they're not cut with wires they're simply a hand handmade brick and they're not going to be uniform in dimension and we can find this at buildings such as Tattershall and Hearst Monceau and Isha where we can actually measure the brickwork and we'll actually see quite a variety um, in measurements but for the purpose of this exercise I just want to point out to you that the brick tends to be twice as long as it is deep um, that enables them to be stacked one on top of the other with both stretchers the long bricks as you look at the elevation and headers the the, the narrower bricks uh, end on so that we get a thickness in the wall and so that they stack on top of each other accurately if you've got one that's half as deep as it is wide we also see them being quite thin as well so about two inches um, for a medieval brick sometimes a little less maybe an inch and three quarters the range tends to be about 45 millimeters up to just shy of 60 millimeters so 57 59 millimeters the reason for that thinness is firstly to enable them to air dry and also to accurately uh, um, burn in the in in the in the um, uh, in in the clamp without them remaining soggy within. So to 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 get a good firing, also so that they can be easily held by the brick maker or, or the brick mason, the person who's laying the bricks. The advantage of brick is that it can be held relatively easily in one hand. We're not having to have two three blokes picking up a great big lump of stone and edging it onto the wall or even using cranes and blocks and tackles to winch it in place one man can pick up a brick and lay perhaps a thousand bricks in one day it's a very very quick operation so there are advantages to it and that explains why the bricks tend to be quite thin to enable the brick masons to pick them up but also to ensure that they accurately fire in the clamp kilns so those brick masons who are a different category of 
construction workers to the brick makers themselves. The brick masons are just like the stone masons, except they work in brick. Now, I'm sure that there is some crossover between the two, although we do know at Tattershall from the building accounts, which were published in the 1960s, where we have um, four or five years of operations, we do know, for example, there that the brick masons are very distinct from the stone masons. So if the, the, we're not seeing people laying in both materials and we get glimpses of these people um so for example in the in the in the, one of the earliest years of construction um 1534 to 35 we can see that over 50 quid is expended on brick masons wages and they're ordering and then laying just over half a million bricks from one kiln alone at Edlington Moor. There is a second kiln referred to, and that probably accounts for why we're getting more bricks uh, in its slightly later building years. You can see that um, they're actually laying in excess of a million bricks in 1438-39. Um, uh, the big year for brick consumption at Tattershall is, of course, 39 into 40, where we're seeing four, well, almost four and three quarter million bricks coming into the site. That's really ramping up the construction work on site, which has already been going on probably for almost a decade by this period in time. It just gives you an idea of how long it takes to build a castle like this. Of course, we only have the Great Tower surviving, really. There are lots and lots of other structures which are long gone, three um, uh, principal gatehouses, another two gatehouses, lots of other towers, walls, lodging ranges, stables, etc., etc. It requires tremendous amounts of effort. And we see um, the building operations going on for about 20 years at this site. However, let's backtrack a little bit and consider when bricks start to enter the canon of English building work. Um, we do have early brick structures. The Romans built quite extensively in brick. To all intents and purposes, what is an overdeveloped tile, a thickened, very deep squared tile. And we can see these leveling uh, layers within Roman buildings, such as the third century Multangular Tower in York, um, which has brickwork within it. Now, the Multangular Tower is Roman, but is then capped in the medieval period. So we can imagine the builders seeing this funny old fashioned building material and perhaps being curious about it in the later 13th century. Other builders had actually been using Roman bricks in um, their own construction, such as St. Botolph's at Colchester. This is a, a monastery, the church of the monastery. And you can see that the, the arch of the principal door, the blind arcading, leveling layers, parts of the windows are constructed in reused and recycled Roman material. So there's already an element of familiarity with this ceramic building material, albeit at this period in time, they're not either importing it or using their own uh, bricks, which they are constructing in this country. So there's a familiarity with, with the material. And then I mentioned imports because we do have some references to imports from the continent, which is obviously an area which I've already mentioned as being ahead of England in the use of bricks. Um, and so we can see the royal using brickwork at the Tower of London, in particular in 1278. If you go and read your Salzman uh, building in England down to 1540, came out in the 50s, you can look through that and you can find lots of references to brickwork in that period. And there's this one nice example of um, uh, over 200,000 bricks being purchased from John Bardown of Ypres. He's a brick maker and uh, they expend 20 pounds on that. And then those bricks are transported by sea by Hugh Beckman of Newport for 32 pounds, five shillings. So they're brought over the North Sea. Obviously, London's a port town at the time. They can dock immediately adjacent to the Tower of London in the Pool of London, and then they can be used. And we learn that they were actually being used uh, at this period in time to build the wall between the castle 
and the city. And that's probably the north wall of the Tower of London. We've subsequently lost the evidence of that, although there is some archaeological evidence below ground for the use of brick. Now, a lot is sort of stated about the importation of brick, and it is assumed that all medieval brickwork is brought into this country. Um, f from abroad. I've read rumours about that at Tattershall, for example, but we already know from the building accounts of many of these structures that the bricks are being made in other contexts. It is actually quite rare, and the reason for that rarity is there in white on black on this screen. It's the expense of transportation. You can see that those bricks on their own cost £20, but it costs £32 to bring them across. Well, why not have your own local um, uh, brick makers and you don't have to pay quite such a high transportation cost? One of the biggest expenses, not just in the medieval period, but in the modern period in construction is transportation. So if you can get around that by having a local brickyard, then you might be able to save yourself a few quid. And so what does start to happen in this country is we do start to see early indigenous production of bricks. Um, a real outlier on this is the guest house at Coggleshall, um, where we actually see quite a few buildings constructed in brick. This is 12th century. This is seriously, seriously early, probably being driven by continental links. Um, but this is what we see here is an early English style Gothic building with those pointed lancet arches picked out in brick. And you can also see some elements uh, of, of the, um, the coins and also some of the main fabric of the building are picked out in brick there as well. Seriously early production. Contemporary with the work at the Tower of London, where we are seeing importation, is indigenous production at Little Wenham in Suffolk, where we see uh, a small castle or a hall being built somewhere in the later 13th century. And this is really the beginnings of brick production in this country, where we start to see important elite buildings being constructed in brick. Now, you might think, where are they getting these ideas from? How are those ideas flowing around the North Sea? Well, one of the ways that that can be explained is the trading networks of the Hanseatic League, which is a slightly um, uh, extended group of cities which have trade agreements with one another. And so that you, we have this 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 drawn out uh, region around the Baltic and the North Sea, where the Hanseatic League, who have these contracts with each other um, to engage in free trade to all intents, um, uh, are able to uh, en engage not just trade, but the flow of ideas as well. So people are moving through these states with their ideas. You've got uh, merchants traveling from one country to another, seeing the buildings of different lands, coming home with those ideas. And I think the Hanseatic League is helping to engender uh, these ideas. Uh, of architecturally. And many of the, um, uh, the, the cities and towns of Eastern England are part of this league. Hull, Boston, Lynn in Norfolk, and of course, London. The hands of, are first recorded in London in the 1280s. That's, that's, the, that's the origin of the hands in this country. And they have um, a building called the Still Yard, which is just down from London Bridge. You can see the, the bridge um, over, over to Southwark there. There. And there's this rather fine quote from Jane, uh, Jane White, uh, who wrote a, a really chunky history of brick building in England. And she says, uh, a Hanseatic merchant's establishment was a cultural influence and symptom of growth. So there's a real importance being laid, a cultural importance, which is helping to spread ideas. And we can see this physically at the port of Boston. Now, Boston now is quite a quiet market town. It's quite remote. But in the medieval period, Boston in Lincolnshire was one of the most important uh, towns in England. 
and we see a German uh, merchant, Visselus de Smallenburg, in fact, moving to Boston. So as impressed is he with the opportunities for making money. And he's eventually buried at Boston Stump, um, uh, known as, uh, well, known as Boston Stump, the, the, the church in the background there, St. Botolph's. So we can see this in the 14th century, as the hands are really starting to get their fingers into English trade. Um, this does start to have an effect on architecture. Now, sadly, we don't have hardly any Hanseatic architecture surviving. The one building that we do still have above ground is the warehouse known as a contour at King's Lynn in Norfolk. Now, this is built at the end of the 15th century, so it's quite a long way down the story of the Hansa. And it's actually at a period where the Hansa are, um, to be honest with you, there is an Anglo Hanseatic war being fought, um, which is settled only the year before the establishment of this contour, this warehouse. But the, the point point here is that although there is brick involved in this, it doesn't look too different to indigenous timber framed traditions of the east of the country, such as uh, the Blue Pig at Grantham or the Governor's House at Newark, where we've got masonry ground floors with timber framing above. And ultimately, the contour at Kings Lynn is being built in this English tradition. And the reason we have to draw attention to this is because something else is going on in brick architecture on the con continent. And unfortunately, the warehouse at Lynn doesn't really bear relevance to what is going on there. So when we're actually talking about the influence of brick buildings on the continent, it's structures such as these that we must be looking to. The Baltic style. We're looking at huge churches built almost entirely of brick with beautiful vaulting. All of the columns, the clustered columns, are brick here, the piers. We're looking at this gorgeous elevation, the Rat House at Stralsund, Germany, where we've got rows of um, uh, open ended uh, arches. We've got windows above with complex tracery, recessed arcading. And then above and above and above, we've got more and more serried ranks of windows and roundels with um, gable ends and finials. Again, this is how you do it in brick. This is why um, the English are looking to the to the European experience for brickwork in terms of uh, having um, a, um, uh, a, an influence on England. They are looking to the people that have been doing this for a long period of time. And it's not just churches and town halls, but also castles. And castles is going to become quite important in the story as this lecture develops. And this is perhaps another way in which ideas are passing around. The Teutonic Knights, uh, who have their principal uh, base of operations in Northern Europe at Malbork, now in Poland. They've been involved in trying to Christianize areas, including Lithuania and Latvia, which held on as pagan for a very long period of time. By the later medieval period, they're involved in local politics, but they are building these enormous brick castles in areas where there really isn't uh, an availability of stone. So they turn to the ceramic uh, building material um, to get over that problem. And the Teutonic Knights have close contacts with many people in the English aristocracy. So uh, Henry of Bolingbroke, later Henry IV, goes on crusade with the Teutonic Knights in the 1390s. And he takes John Fastolf with him, his knight retainer. And we'll see the impact of this experience of the Teutonic castles uh, in just a moment in time. But by looking to these great continental buildings, by really the 14th century, we can start to see the English becoming interested in brick. And one of the earliest of these buildings, these greater buildings that we're seeing constructed, is Holy Trinity in Hull. And we can see here the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the great body of the church here is constructed from brick. They're using it as masons would use ashlar stonework. Now, the detailing is all in stone. The crenellations, the finials, the buttresses, 
um, the window tracery is all in stone. Of course, the tower is there in stone as well. But the body, they've relied on brick. They understand that this is an emerging fabric and they're starting to show an interest in it. And over time, as the 14th century does develop, we start to see a greater familiarity throughout Eastern England. So that by the end of the century, that familiarity has begun to flourish. Now, it still must be said that stone plays a big part in this architecture. We can certainly see that at Thornton Abbey in North Lincolnshire, where we've got these great turrets, which are all constructed out of stone. The statuary and the statue niches are all from stone. And of course, the main body of the ground floor gatehouse here are in um, uh, in stone. But there are still elements in brick. So again, the body of the building, the Ashler is built in brick, but also if you look there, the left-hand turret is in fact built from brick as well. So they're starting to experiment. The two projecting bridge abutments there are a later uh, insertion, their 16th century. Um, and it's not just these great church buildings as well, but we're also seeing guild halls in the urban centre of Boston, which of course we've already noted as being in close contact with the Hanseatic League. Here we see um, St Mary's Guild Hall, again the main body of the building constructed in the 1390s in brick. But where we can start to to see something of the playful European experience of brickwork is in self-standing towers. Uh, here are a couple of examples from Beverly from the early years, the first decade of the 15th century. And to all intents, this is a Baltic style building. We've got those crow stepped gables at the top of the building. We've got the recessed niches, the use of shields. These are all very Baltic in style. Uh, and again, similar um, designs here with that blind arcading at Prior Overton's tower from the middle years of the 15th century at Repton. Quite a Western example of brickwork, actually, in Derbyshire. We don't really get much um, further to the West here. We get some in Oxfordshire, um, but in, in the main, we're seeing an Eastern counties and a Southeastern tradition in the use of medieval brickwork. And if this is sort of giving us a glimpse into how the brick masons in this country are starting to experiment, starting to get a confidence going with their brick architecture, there is an explosion in the mid 15th century. Now, it is an elite explosion. We're not really seeing buildings below the level of the castle or the great house or the church or the monastery being built in brick. Um, I can think of one example, and that's a manorial mill at Tattershall, um, but it's really not common for building in brick below this particular level. And even there, the patron at Tattershall is, is a great lord uh, who's paying for the, for the mill, and it's probably using off cuts from the castle itself. Here we can see uh, Rye House and Summaries, uh, buildings that are quite close to each other, built by men that knew each other. Sir Andrew Ogod sounds very English. He's not actually, he's Danish. Um, so we might be seeing um, a, a Danish retainer of the monarchy, a, a soldier in the Hundred Years' War, Andres Peterson. Uh, he's coming over, building his dream house. He's allowed to settle in England because he's given such great military service and he's bringing those ideas home to roost and we can see lots and lots of the baltic continental style probably from buildings which peterson himself has seen there are those recessed machicolations which are aping um uh military functional machicolations for dropping unpleasant things on your on your enemies but here they are entirely decorative in that baltic tradition very much like those um, blind arches at Beverly. The, the windows are ahead of their time. Um, the windows here at Rye House and also at contemporary Faultbourne in Essex look not unlike 16th or even 17th century cross frame windows. And yet here we're in the middle of the 15th century. Um, this, this is, uh, there has been some reworking to it, but it is 
a genuine 15th century window in its original form. And then this vaulting as well, all in brick with some stone detailing at the um, at, at the, um, the joins for, for the bosses there. But again, this is very much like what's going on internally in those great Baltic buildings. If we think about the example from Sweden a little while ago. And then the artistic elaboration of the buildings through the use of these burnt ends uh, where the brick has become overfired in the clamp kiln and they pick out patterns in the diaper work, lozenges, diamonds uh, and lattices prevailing. That idea is coming from really the 12th and 13th centuries in the Baltic states. Malbork has quite an early example of diaper work we can see here around this gatehouse. Um, it's arriving in England in the 1410s at Uelm um, for Della Pole's great house there. Um, and then flourishing in the middle years of the 15th century. So if the Baltic style is definitely prevailing, So are the Vassabra of the Lower Rhinelands. Now, these are water castles, and there are lots of examples of these in the Lower Rhinelands, whether it be the Berg Kempen or the Mridestadt in Holland, um, uh, both from the 14th century. And you can see their design here, great big, very tall, substantial uh, corner towers with projecting machiculations at the top of the towers. Um, there are quite fine um, windows popped in through there. We're getting things like uh, gun loops, uh, squared towers for uh, gatehouses, uh, brick um, uh, bridges crossing over those fine moats. And we can consider that these types of water castle have an effect on the English aristocracy as well. And probably the greatest example of the transition of the water castle from the Rhinelands to England comes from Norfolk. And it's one of my favourite castles, actually, one that I would love to do some more research into. And it's Caister, which is near Yarmouth. And here we see John Fastolf's great castle. And we can see lots of um, uh, those motifs which we saw in the previous castle, the machiculations at the top, the square headed windows, the square gatehouse right in the bottom right hand corner there, the extensive moats. Now, these are fine, great houses intended for elite, prestigious living to show off Fastolf's great wealth and power. He's really made his name as a soldier fighting, firstly, for Henry of Bolingbroke. He goes on one of those crusades with the Teutonic Knights. And I don't think it's a big stretch to imagine that Fastolf had seen these water castles himself, decided he wanted one. And after he's done later service in the Hundred Years' War, he fights with both Henry IV, Henry V, fifth um gets onto the royal council that kind of thing he comes home and he spends his uh, the money that he's made on booty and ransoms on one of these castles and there's lots and lots of elaboration now we've lost much of caster this is the great hall range between that great tower and the, the back gate essentially and we can see that we've got some projections um, which were supporting an upper gallery. But by doing a bit of buildings archaeology, we can actually see that what's going on within that blue square would have looked something like the top of the tower at Tattershall, but behind the Great Hall range. So we've got one of these double height machiculated galleries. Uh, we've got the wall scar here uh, supported on these, uh, these arches. There's a blocked door here which would have led onto a wall walk and it would have had a machiculated, um, a crenellated wall coming along here as well. So it would have looked very much like um, Tattershall. This element here would look like this element here and then the wall tops themselves uh, is what's going on here. So these water castles are tremendously elaborate. Now, 
Tattershall itself, to an extent, is a water castle in that it is in very low lying Fenland, but its moats are perhaps not as extensive as the one around Caister. Its inner moat is quite wide, particularly to the north. Um, it's a very large castle. It has three wards. It has quite a circuitous access an outer gate, a middle gate, and an inner gate. And it's dominated by this great tower built of brick with stone detailing. And again, there's lots of the continent in this building, as we've just seen at Caister as well. So the ideas are flowing across the North Sea. The tower itself now denuded of its lead spirelets, which did actually survive until about 1900, or one of them did anyway. These pointed lead spires on top of the towers. I really wish that uh, Curzon and his architect Weir in the 1910s had replaced these. But these would be something like what we see in Holland, for example, at the Muderslot. Um, so we can imagine these lead spirelets sat on top of this brick great tower and, and taking influence from those continental buildings. Um, at a slightly later period, when the solar block uh, adjacent to the Great Hall, now lost, is constructed in probably the early modern period, they're opting for a crow-stepped gable, which looks remarkably like um, this uh, warehouse from Lübeck, um, crow step gables, which we've already seen uh, coming in from Baltic architecture at the North Bar in Beverly. So even at this late period in time, long after the original construction of the building in the 15th century, maybe a century or two later, there's still these ideas of continental architecture washing around in the brickwork. Um, the vaulting of Tattershall is always commented as being really quite elaborate and important. Here we see a processional corridor. It's some of the earliest brick vaulting in a secular building in this country. And although it's a bit clunkier, we can see something of Malbork about it uh, with this processional cloistered corridor um, that we see on the right hand side there there's something of Tattershall in that design even in the detail of the vaulting we can see that we've got these um, uh, brick molded and carved um, designs including um, uh, trefoils and wheel traceries and triskeles and it's relatively similar to some of the designs that we can see on the exterior of buildings such as the uh, the Mary Church again at Lübeck too but it's not just a continental building at Tattershall there is also something else going on at this great castle as well we can also see something of the English experience as well um, so it's a building that looks both to the continent, but also to its indigenous styles too. And we can see something of indigenous vaulting designs here in the lobby at Tattershall on the top right, which is to all intents, similar to what's going on a little bit prior to Tattershall at Winchester. It's not just the vaulting though, the design of the Great Tower in and of itself. Yes, it is looking to some continental uh, examples, particularly in France, um, but also looking to older Anglo-Norman towers such as Newcastle from the 1170s. So it's a building that's playing with ideas. It's looking to France, it's looking to the Low Countries, looking to ba the Baltic, but also considering the English experience too. Very complex system of ideas. And Caister and Tattershall are at the forefront of this explosion in brick building in the 15th century. So eventually we see the royal family catching up on these ideas. They see what their aristocrats are doing, what their retainers are doing. And by the 1440s, Henry VI, who has started off as a very, very young child, is of age and he himself is starting to build. And he's looking, unusually, he's looking to his circle, his courtiers, for influence. What have they been building while he was growing up? And he looks to the ideas of places such as Caister and Tattershall, and it's those which help um, to propagate the court style, the royal architectural styles. Now, royal architecture in this period really begins with Sheen, 
It's a, a Plantagenet palace, which was dropped by Richard II, rebuilt under Henry V, and then massively expanded by Henry VI. And the interesting thing from the building accounts at Sheen, which is now Richmond Palace, um, we really lost medieval Sheen, and we only really have much later 15th century brickwork surviving, is that in the middle years of the 15th century, in the 1440s, what is being built is in brick. And we learned that there's a great quadrangle with a gatehouse. And that word quadrangle tells us already that they're building a new style. It's a rectilinear formal courtyard progression and that we have the new close of brick around the garden as well. So much of this palace at Sheen, sadly now lost, is built in brick. To get a glimpse of what Henry VI Sheen may have looked like, we only have to go relatively close by to Eton in Surrey to understand what that great quadrangle with a gatehouse might have looked like. That said, the gatehouse here that we see is 16th century, but it is in a 15th century style. We see a rectilinear courtyard, ranks of a brick buildings with stone detailing, crenellations on the top, chimneys projecting, uh, arcaded cloisters in cloister court there. This is something like what Sheen must have looked like, albeit couched as a college, which may also have been operating as a chantry as well. Um, contemporary although slightly later than the lower school, is Margaret of Anjou, the Queen of England's Queen's College at um, Cambridge. And here we can see um, a gatehouse intact, in fact, with its courtyard around. And again, this great quadrangle, brick with stone detailing, gatehouse with uh, octagonal towers in the Tattershall model. So if we're looking for how to define this royal court style of the Lancastrian era. There are certain motifs to look for, and brick is at the heart of all of them. Um, but it must be said that some of the details of the court style are in stone as well, because they do favour brick with stone detailing. It's not all tracery picked out in brick. They're still using stonework. So in this period of English Gothic, we'd be looking for what's called the perpendicular style. It's called perpendicular perpendicular because we would find a window mullion running from the sill all the way up to the crown of the arch and that defines English perpendicular style of the 14th, 15th and early 16th century. Something odd happens in that the court style doesn't favour this. It favours tracery with these earlier pre-perpendicular decorated Gothic um, styles. So we don't see the mullions rising all the way through the building. And there it is uh, another one of uh, uh, Henry's works at Cambridge at King's College. Uh, it's also there slightly earlier in the works of both Fastolf and Cromwell at Tattershall and Caister. We don't see the mullion rising all the way up. This is an antiquated style which is favoured in the brick and stone architecture of the period. They're also really taken with diaper work. We saw that at Malbork earlier. They're really starting to get quite playful with this. Crosses, shields, Marian iconography, the, the M for Maria there at Tattershall. They're, they're starting to elaborate this and diaper work becomes an important part of your status display, uh, your prestigious uh, artistic representation of lordship. Internally, when you're accessing staircases and rising through these magnificent buildings, one of the little markers of prestige is to actually have a recessed handrail on the staircase. We can see a slightly earlier, possibly not fully founded version of this at Caister, by the time of Tattershall and, and then later at Eton, they're fleshed out in stone. But this is another way in which you demonstrate your power and majesty, just the detailing. It, you know, everything is, is shown to be posh and important. And the ultimate expression of lordship in the court style is the use of these great towers, either self-standing, uh, such as the residential tower at Tattershall, or formulated as a gatehouse at Hurst Monceau. Um, the tower is the ultimate impression of lordship. It is 
always been the most important way of showing off your majesty. Um, we could discuss that in a whole lecture in and of its own. But these brick towers, they become the future, whether as a great tower or, in fact, as we move into the later 15th and 16th centuries, the gatehouse becomes the architectural focus of a castle picked out in brickwork. And at the top of your tower, you can even have your arcaded cloister at Tattershall where you can promenade with your retainers in heated banqueting suites in those turrets. You can look at your landscape from your great brick tower. Sometimes, though, the arcaded cloisters are at ground floor, such as the ones at Eton. And also very similar to Eton, we can see the ones at Hurst Monceau, now much altered. But you can start to see how these ideas of the court style in brick and stone are transmuted through um, the social networks of these great lords at places like Eton and Hurstmont. So, because although Eton is being built with Henry VI as the patron, the master builder there is Robert Westerly. And Westerly is being paid by the Lord Treasurer, who is Sir Roger Fiennes. And Fiennes then brings Westerly to work on his own castle at Hurst Monceau. And with him comes the brickmaker, John Rowland, who might actually be an early example of an English brickmaker. So we see the social networks. The man who is paying for the works at Eton brings the king's mason to his own castle, along with the master brickmaker as well. And you can see how the ideas pass from one site to another and why we get visually similar aesthetics between buildings. And that essentially helps us to explain the end of the story as I'm going to bring the lecture to a close in the next five or six minutes. Um, as we move beyond the Lancastrian court style into the period of the Yorkists and then the Tudors in the later 15th and earlier 16th century. And certainly one of the big movers in the translation of brick from the earlier 15th century to the later 15th century is William Wainfleet. And again, he's a man who brings a build with him. The importance of the dialogue between patron and builder cannot be stressed more highly. And these two are probably the ones that really do help to shape the brick experience of the late medieval period. Wayne Fleet's the Bishop of Winchester. Cowper is his master builder. They probably meet as a result of Wayne Fleet's work at Eton when he is the provost there. So he's already seeing this earlier architecture. He then moves on to become headmaster at Winchester. And this is probably where he starts working with a very young Cowper as a journeyman mason. And Cowper also builds a bridge for him at um, and then we see Cowper coming into his own when he's sent off to work at Tattershall. Lord Cromwell, the patron of the Great Tower, has died and he's left a bunch of money to Wainfleet for charitable works. And two of those works are to build churches at Lamley in Nottinghamshire and more importantly at Tattershall in Lincolnshire. And you can see the spatial relationship between church and tower. We've got Cowper working away on that church, looking across the way at the Great Tower, knowing what he already knows from uh, Wainfleet's work uh, at Eton and formulating those ideas. So that when Wainfleet wants Cowper to build himself some houses, this is what starts to happen. We see those ideas from Tattershall, from Eton, coming through into the later 15th century in Wainfleet's own buildings at places like Farnham, at Esher, and at Wainfleet itself. Now, there are Tattershall-esque monikers, Lancastrian court-style monikers, motifs all over these. I must say that the windows and the, uh, the porch of Isha are all later. They're William Kent, 1730s. But the form of this great tower, formerly a gatehouse, um, is very Tattershall-esque, as is the frontage of Wainfleet. And of course, Farnham there with its um, uh, octagonal tower, its false machicolations, its diaper work. This is the tradition being passed on down to the later period. Um, but Cowper is not just working for Wainfleet, he's also working for other great lords of the period. So he takes his experience and he's working for Hastings at um, uh, 
uh, Kirby Muxlow at exactly the same time that he's working at Tattershall. There's even something in the building accounts for Kirby Muxlow to say, and John Cowper was paid his travel time between the two buildings. So he's taking these ideas and he's developing them. And again, here we can see those brick ideas, octagonal uh, turrets, brick and stone detailing, uh, the presence of diaper work in the gatehouse at Kirby Muxlow. And towards the end of Cowper's life, he possibly worked for the Bishop of Lincoln at Buckton, which is Tattershall in miniature. Uh, and it even comes with one of those arcaded parapets that we've seen a couple of times already um, uh, down here in the, uh, the, the, the wall between the Great Tower and the Inner Gatehouse. But again, this is a Tattershall-esque Lancastrian court style building at the end of the 15th century in close association with the parish church there. Uh, and really to draw this to a close, we can see the style moving on. Um, we can see um, it there in the 1480s, contemporary with Buckton, uh, Oxborough uh, in, in Norfolk and at Gainsborough, two buildings which are going up at more or less the same time. Uh, a, a great tower at Gainsborough and a, and a gatehouse at Oxborough. And then towards the very end of the century, uh, we can see these, these buildings developing into courtyard houses houses of the Tudor era at places like Home Pierpont and Hodsock in Nottinghamshire. And this is the last gasp of the medieval before we start to really feel the presence of the Renaissance. And it is buildings such as Hampton Court Palace, which without the presence of the fancy roundels with the, um, the, the busts of, of emperors and gods within them at Hampton Court, we might think of this as being a purely medieval building. We can start to see something else going on at Leomani, the presence of really, really expansive windows at Leomani feels more Tudor. This is presaging what's going on at Hardwick with Robert Smith's great building there the windows have expanded greatly and we can start to feel that renaissance development there um, and that carries on through contemporaneously at the vine now when we look at the vine that is a building which to all intents looks like it is of the period of perhaps elizabeth an early elizabethan e-shaped house um, it's looking forward to somewhere like lanhydrock in cornwall built of stone of course but it's not it's a building of the first two decades of the 16th century. This is the Renaissance arriving. And when the Renaissance arrives, it wants brick. That is how they are building now. We're not having that old fashioned stone. We want it in brick, but we have these, these courtyard houses beautifully uh, arrayed. There is still the last gasp of the Lancastrian court style at places like Guildford, where we are really seeing a tattershall tower 200 years after Tattershall. But the future is the vine. So I'll leave you with that thought um, while I make some conclusions and then we'll move on to questions. Uh, ultimately, brick in this country becomes an especially important building material from the later 14th century. And as we move into the 15th century, it becomes what you really have to build in. Um, we see it most commonly in areas where there isn't great amounts of building stone. So Norfolk, Suffolk, Essex, Cambridgeshire, Lincolnshire, although Lincolnshire does have some quite good stone, but still that's it's part of that North Sea diaspora. Um, ideas are coming over from the continent and the, the, the expertise, certainly in the earlier period, is European as well as we get uh, brick makers from the continent. Um, by the mid 15th century, it's that Lancastrian court style, which was defined in this talk, which comes to dominate. It comes in via Caister and Tattershall, which are European looking buildings. And then it flourishes under the patronage of Henry VI and the court circle. There's a close development between the patron and the builder. The builders are as important in the story as the people paying for it. And the style hangs on for about 200 years. Guildford's a late example of it, but it develops into the Renaissance. So this is a way of explaining the development from, say, the castles of Edward I to 
the great houses of the Elizabethan period. This is the story which explains what happens in between. Now, I usually get asked for book recommendations at this period in time, apart from the guidebooks or the the, the, the big boys and girls books on particular castles. Um, I would recommend uh, these on bricks in particular. Uh, the History of English Brickwork by Nathaniel Lloyd came out in the 20s still holds up really, really well. It's a glorious uh, essay, uh, a love letter to brickwork, if you like, which then has a really substantial section of black and white, high quality um, photographs at the end. More modern is Campbell and Price's book about the history of bricks across the world, again, lavishly illustrated. For those who are a bit more nerdy, perhaps, get yourselves a copy of uh, Brick Building in England by Jane White. Accessible material, anything by Brunskill is always very, very accessible. And he was involved in two books on bricks. If you're interested in, in later bricks, uh, David Kitching's book on British bricks will give you the story about what happens in the post medieval period. Um, but just a good introduction to uh, brick, um, brick building is also the Shire Guide, which you can see on the top of the pile. But I always recommend Salzman's book, Building in England, too, because it gives you an idea of how the building trade operated in this period in time. Um, so I hope you've enjoyed that run through late medieval brickwork. Um, it behoves me to signpost. Um, the next lecture in the series as well, the medieval myth busting series of lectures, which will take place during the winter of 21, 22, one a month. The first one on the 18th of November. Um, can we trace the origins of the, the myth of sword fighting on um, uh, castle staircases? So thanks very much for listening to that. Um, there's my contact details in case I'm not able to answer your question. Um, join the q and a um, you can you can contact me on email or twitter i have a slight preference for twitter questions if at all possible if you use that otherwise you can email me um, that goes for anybody that might watch the upload on youtube um, um, but what I'm going to do now is um, stop recording the lecture and then I will upload this to YouTube for anybody who wasn't able to, uh, to attend. Um, I'm not going to include the Q&A in the YouTube upload, though. So we'll see.